It's difficult to follow such uh, raging optimists. But I can assure you, it's actually far worse than they say. Uh, first, there are no technocrats, especially the genius technocrats. I suggest a new rule of thumb for judging a genius technocrat. They have to be at right at least two out of 10 times. And there's not a single economist in Europe who calls himself a technocrat that could do the equivalent of making two penalty kicks out of 10. So, um, I'm going to pick up on some of the things that Michael has talked about. He quoted Balzac's famous phrase that behind every great fortune lies a great scandal. And I'm going to explain how that works. So you will now learn how to steal 10 billion euros. The purpose of this is not so that you will steal 10 billion euros. The purpose is so that you can be an intelligent lion because they feed on sheep. All right. We've been asked to do our talks in four parts. So unlike Gaul, my speech is divided in four parts. This talk will be about why we suffer recurrent, intensifying financial crises. Then I'll explain how theoclassical economic dogma produces these disasters. The third part will be to explain why our response to the crisis has made it worse. And I actually will end on an optimistic note. The fourth part is how we have succeeded in some places at some times and why you can do the same. Part one sounds like one question. Why do we have recurrent intensifying financial crises? But it's really two questions. The first one asks, what is the cause of these crises? The second one says, well, wait a minute. We keep on suffering crises. Why don't we learn the right lessons from these crises? So part one will focus on what caused the crises. Part two will focus on why ideology prevents us from learning the right lessons. Santayana's famous phrase, of course, is that those that forget the mistakes of the past are condemned to repeat them. But even if we remember the mistakes we've made, the new policy we pick could be another mistake. So part three discusses that in part. But part four says the real tragedy is when you forget the successes of the past. When you have something that you know works and that you refuse to use. Because as Michael said, there is not an economics textbook in the world that warns you that elite CEOs often become wealthy through fraud. And there is a primitive tribal taboo 
in economics in English against using the five letter F word. Fraud. When I go to and talk to groups of economists who are traditional, I start out the meeting by asking them each to say out loud the word fraud. You can't believe how difficult it is for them even to utter the word. All right, so as I said, the lessons of success, it's a real tragedy to forget them. And I'm going to quote from George Akerlof and Paul Romer's famous article, or at least an article that should be famous, where the title says it all. Looting the economic underworld a bankruptcy for profit. Right? So the bank fails or in the modern era is bailed out but the CEO walks away wealthy. Right? And this is what Akerlof and Romer wrote about 20 years ago. Neither the public nor economists foresaw that savings and loan deregulation was bound to produce looting, nor unaware of the concept could they have known how serious it would be. Thus the regulators in the field who understood what was happening from the beginning found lukewarm support at best for their cause. Now we know better. If we learn from experience, history need not repeat itself. George Akerlof was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2001. So you might think economists would pay attention. You might think since this article was written nearly 20 years ago that the textbooks would mention fraud and looting. They don't just ignore everyone here. They ignore Nobel Prize winners in economics. So what again was this lesson? It was the regulators in the field. The little people. Not the fancy people. Who understood from the beginning that deregulation would lead to massive looting. And it was the economists that ignored them. And after we had proven that it was fraud, after we had sent over a thousand elite bankers and their cronies to prison, after a Nobel Prize winner warned about it. After all those things, they ignored it and produced crisis after crisis, including the one we experience now. So what did we know out of that savings and loan crisis that was widely described at the time as the worst financial scandal in U.S. history, and we have a history rich in scandal. Here is what the National Commission that investigated the causes of the crisis reported. 
the typical large failure grew at an extremely rapid rate, achieving high concentrations of assets in risky ventures. Every accounting trick available was used. Evidence of fraud was invariably present, as was the ability of the operators to milk the organization. That means to loot the organization. But speaking of milk, The frauds I'm describing are in no way limited to the United States. They exist in every country, and they are common enough to explain, and they are old enough to explain what Balzac was saying. Because Many of the wealthy become rich through precisely the scandals, the fraud I will describe. In criminology, we call them financial super predators when we're being lyrical. When we're writing journals, we call them control frauds which is boring. Control fraud occurs when the person who controls a seemingly legitimate entity, like Parmalat, uses it as a weapon to defraud. And they can often use this weapon with impunity. In finance, accounting is the weapon of choice. And these accounting frauds cause greater losses than all other property crimes combined. Yet economics, again, never talks about it. Worse, when many of these frauds occur in the same area, they hyperinflate financial bubbles, which is what causes financial crises and mass unemployment. It makes the CEOs wealthy, produces Balzac scandals, and destroys democracy. In criminology, we talk about criminogenic environments. Long words, simple concept. When the incentives are extremely perverse, you will get widespread fraud. So what makes for perverse incentives? The ability to steal a lot of money and not go to prison, and not having to live in disgrace. In practice, that means, in English, the three Ds. Deregulation, desupervision, and de facto decriminalization. Deregulation, you get rid of the rules. Desupervision, any rules that remain, you don't enforce. Decriminalization, even if you sometimes sue them and get a fine, you don't put them in prison. So that's the first area, deregulation. The second area is executive compensation. And what is ideal for accounting fraud? really high pay based on short-term reported income with no way to claw it back 
even when it proves to be a lie. Those are the most important, but it's also good if your assets don't have a readily verifiable market value, because then it's easy to inflate the asset prices and it's easy to hide the real losses. And if you want a true epidemic of fraud, if entry into the industry is very easy, then you'll get much more fraud. So this is what you were waiting for, at least from me. This is the recipe, only four ingredients that bankers in many parts of the world use to be become billionaires. And again, it's one that Akerlof and Romer agreed with. So first ingredient, grow massively. Two, by making really, really crappy loans. But at a high interest rate. Third ingredient, extreme leverage. That just means a lot of corporate debt. Fourth ingredient, set aside virtually no loss reserves for the massive losses that will be coming. By the way, in Europe, this last ingredient is mandated by international accounting rules, which are incredibly fraud friendly. And everybody knows that in accounting, and nobody has changed it. If you do these four things, you are mathematically guaranteed to report record short-term income. This is why Akerlof and Romer referred to it as a sure thing. It's guaranteed. There are actually three sure things. The bank will report record profits the profits, of course, are fictional. The CEO will promptly become wealthy. And down the road, the bank will suffer catastrophic losses. Again, if many banks do this, you will hyperinflate a bubble. This recipe helps explain why bankers hate markets, why bankers hate capitalism, why they hate anything like an effective market. So here's a thought exercise. What if you were a CEO of a bank and you wanted to grow exceptionally rapidly? The first ingredient to the fraud recipe. That means 50% a year, and that's realistic. That's what the banks in Iceland, that's one of many of the banks in Europe, continental Europe, and the US also did. How would you do that if you were honest? You're in a market that's competitive. The only way to grow that rapidly is to charge far less money, a lower interest rate, for your loans. But if there were a real market, what would your competitors do? They would match your price reduction. You wouldn't end up making any more loans, and all the banks would be loaning at a lower interest rate. So here's the question. Is that a good way to make money as a bank? It's a terrible thing for a bank, right? 
So all the bankers would lose, and that's why they hate markets. And that's why banks are the biggest proponents of crony capitalism and the leaders worldwide in crony capitalism. And that leads us, and that leads us to a discussion of why bad loans are so perfect for bank fraud. You can charge a much higher rate to people who can't get loans because they can't repay the loans. And there are millions, tens of millions of such people. So you can grow very rapidly. You can charge a higher interest rate. If your competitors, if your competitors do the same thing, it's actually good for you because it hyperinflates the bubble and the bad loans, you just refinance them and you hide the losses for many more years. So the CEO takes no risk. All of this is a sure thing. And here's the key question. How many of you are bankers? Not many, right? How much brains does it take to make a bad loan? I think we could all do that. So all the mediocre bankers have a have no way to make money with honest competition, but they have a sure thing if they're willing to follow the fraud recipe. This is, I'm now going to quote from the person, the economist, who, who led the national investigation of the savings and loan crisis. And he called this dynamic I've just explained the ultimate perverse incentive. So this is what he said. Accounting abuses also provided the ultimate perverse incentive. It paid to seek out bad loans because only those who had no intention of repaying would be willing to offer the high loan fees and interest required for the best looting. It was rational for operators, that's CEOs, to drive their banks ever deeper into insolvency as they looted them. That is how crazy a world that theoclassical economics has built. Where the best way, the surest way to become wealthy as a bank CEO is to make the worst possible loans. And to make so many bad loans, they have to gut the underwriting process. Underwriting is what an honest bank does to make sure that it's going to get repaid. But if you want to make bad loans, you have to get rid of your effective underwriting. So this is the key. If you get rid of underwriting, we already established you're not bankers. So 
Imagine all of you run competent, honest bank. And you do underwriting. And you can tell high risk and low risk borrowers. Low risk borrowers, you charge 10%. High risk borrowers, you charge 20%. I run Bill's incompetent bank. I can't tell risk. So I charge everybody 15%. Which borrowers come to me? Only the absolute worst borrowers. No good borrower would come because they could borrow at your bank at 10%. So this is not like a usual risk. In economics, we call this adverse selection. And it means that a bank that makes loans this way must lose vast amounts of money. No honest banker would operate this way. And the banks that engage in these frauds also create criminogenic environments themselves to recruit fraud allies. For example, the people that value homes if they won't inflate the value, the dishonest banks won't use them. Do they need to corrupt every person that values homes? No. 5% of the profession would be fine. They just send all their business to the corrupt. We call them appraisers in America. And this is called a Gresham's dynamic. And it means that cheaters prosper and bad ethics drives good ethics out of the marketplace. Well, what about, what about compensation? In America, the largest corporations, the largest 100, created a group to lobby called the Business Roundtable. And you remember our Enron era frauds, in early 2000s? Well, they got embarrassed. And so they appointed a task force to look at the frauds. And they named a particular CEO as head of their task force. And, and he was asked by Business Week, why do we have all these frauds? This is the answer he gave. Don't just say, if you hit this revenue number, your bonus is going to be this. It sets up an incentive that's overwhelming. You wave enough money in front of people, and good people will do bad things. And that was Franklin Raines, the head of Fannie Mae, which is now insolvent by about $500 billion. How did Frank Raines know that about this perverse incentive? Because he used it at Fannie Mae to produce the frauds that made him wealthy. How about Ireland? This is a report by a Scandinavian banker hired to do an investigation. Not a real investigation, of course. He reported bonus targets that were intended to be demanding through the pursuit 
of sound policies and prudent spread of risk were easily achieved through volume lending to the property sector. Now that requires a translation, not because it's written in English, but because it's written to be not understood. So what is he really saying? The bank CEO sets a target for income that is huge, three times current income. How can you triple income safely? Wow, if somebody could really do that safely, we'd be happy to pay them a very big bonus, right? But what does he say? You don't have to do it safely. And it isn't hard. You just follow the fraud formula, the recipe. And it's a sure thing. It's easily achieved. What's wrong with his sentence, though? He says the targets were intended to be difficult, demanding. And they were intended to be met through prudent lending. Seriously, you think that? The CEO is deciding how much money is going to, he's going to make. Do you think he intended a demanding target? Or a target that was easily achieved and would make him wealthy? So, I will end on this. We need a Coast Guard for our banks. We can no longer allow CEOs to, to desert their posts after running their banks aground and causing such great destruction. The cruise ship's captain's career is over, but the elite bank CEOs that destroyed the global economy remain wealthy, powerful, and famous because they looted. They were bailed out. They did not leave in a lifeboat in the dark of night. They left in their yachts, yachts that the governments paid for. And no official anywhere in the world has demanded of those bank CEOs who deserted their vessels Grazie.